We're taking a look at section 8.5. This is um, some more difficult content. I would not typically expect, I, I would not include this in uh, my typical college algebra course, algebra 2 course, um, but it's in here. So if you are an advanced student and you're going to plow through this, let me take you through. So, okay, so we have been looking at conic sections, and one of the things that defines a conic, so again, I'm, I'm no expert on this. I haven't spent a ton of time digging into all the details, but I'll give you the, beef, the, the overview and take you through how to, how to get through it. So wh one of the things that defines these conic sections is that we can find something called the eccentricity, which is that um, from the focal point, of the conic section to the directrix, which we've seen in the previous three sections, it is the there is a constant ratio between that distance from the focus to any point on the conic section. So what I'm saying here is we have a distance from the focus to this point here, any point, but we'll call it a generic point. The same distance, the perpendicular distance from the directrix to that point, it always makes a ratio. So this is just saying we have this ratio between these two line segments. And the ratio is going to be called the eccentricity. Now, um, if you know the eccentricity, it can actually tell you which uh, conic section you're dealing with. If it's between 0 and 1, uh, you have an ellipse. If it is 1, you have a parabola. And if it's greater than 1, you have a hyperbola. Now, the directrix can actually be told from this formula. Actually, let me save that for the next slide, I think. So we can define these uh, conic sections in a polar form, just like we've been doing in a Cartesian form. So we've had some experience with polar equations at this point. Now, I'm not going to derive all of these for you, but because uh, I can't. <laughs> but uh, I don't know the, the, the derivation of all these. But what it's saying is that we can define these conic sections in terms of the eccentricity. We can de determine in ter terms of P, which is that value we've used before for the directrix and finding the uh, uh, major and minor axes. Um, and then also we can find it in terms of an angle. So that angle is here. So wherever we are on the conic section, it's creating an angle. And that's about as far as I can take you. I don't know why they're selecting these and how they derive these formulas. But, but here are the polar, polar formulas that we can create. We have a version of this with cosine. And we have a version with sine where E is our eccentricity. P is that value that we, we can use to help build the equation. Now, notice that it's got to be in the form 1 plus or minus the eccentricity of the cosine here. So a couple things that we know. We've got to turn this into a 1 if the equation isn't already. And we can also uh, notice this. The directrix is going to depend on the uh, whether we're using a cosine in the denominator or a sine. So if we're using cosine, and think of cosine as being x, then our directrix is going to be related. It's going to be an x line, a vertical line. And if our, we have sine in the denominator, sine is like y, and so we're going to have a vertical directrix. Okay, So we can define all of these things or discern all of these things from those factors. Okay, now one of the things I, I didn't find, I was working through the problems here and I actually don't see where they told this. It must be somewhere in the book, but um, the directrix is going to take on the sine of the denominator. So this we could have a plus or minus down here. If it's a positive, then our directrix equation is going to be a positive p. If it's a minus in here, then our directrix equation is going to have a negative p. Again, I haven't derived these equations, and I didn't look through a calc book to try to figure out why this all is true. But we're just going to take them at their word, and we're going to work the problems. So first of all, we're going to identify the section um, in a polar form. Now, what we have to do here is that we don't have a 1 here. We need this to be a 1, and when we do, we'll be able to find all the information we need. So here's the trick. I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by 1 third because, of course, if I multiply that through here, this would create a 1, which is what I'm looking for. So I multiply everything by 1 third. Of course, you'd have to distribute that 1 third, and we get here. Okay, well, now we're ready to go. Now, this is going to tell us all the information that we need. So we have sine in the denominator. So this is telling me my directrix is going to be a y. It's going to be a horizontal line. And it's a positive here, so I know it's going to be a positive. 
Now, the eccentricity is actually this value just so if you have it where this is 1, eccentricity is just that number right in front of the, the trig function. So the eccentricity is 2 thirds. And I don't have all these down. I believe that's the one that's an ellipse. So if you're between 0 and 1, you your conic section is an ellipse. So this tells me I have an ellipse. And all right, yes, if we want to make the directrix, we've got to find that value of p. So here's how we know. Um, we have a 2 on the top. And if you look back to our equation, I don't want to go back to another slide again, but this this numerator is equal to EP, the eccentricity times P. Okay, so if this is 2 and I know the eccentricity, I can find P just by flipping that fraction upside down. I get P is 3. So because this was sine, we knew it was Y. Because it's a plus here, we know this is plus, and the value of P tells us the directrix, Y is 3. Okay, let's try some more. Now the next one, we need to create this to be a 1. So we're going to do 1 fourth times the top and the bottom. Distribute that, and I get this in the form that I'm looking for here. So here's my proper form where I can discern all the information that I need. In front of the cosine is my eccentricity, so it's 5 fourths. I've got, um, let's see, this is a cosine, so my directrix is going to be x related, and it's also got a plus in front of there, so it's going to be positive. So the only thing that we need is to find the value of p. Well, 3 equals EP when you're in this right form. So I've got 3 equals EP, and I know E is 5 fourths. So now all i got to do is flip that fraction over, and I can get my value of P, which is 12 over 5. So just add it there, and I've got everything I need. Okay, let's try another one here. So we need to get this to become a 1. So we're doing 1 half on the top and the bottom so that this would distribute and make that a 1. So tidying all this up, we get to here. Okay, now this is sine, so we know our directrix is a y. It's got a negative in front, so it's going to be a negative. Now, our, our eccentricity is actually this value right here in front of the sine function, so that eccentricity is equal to a 1. Okay, so that eccentricity is a 1. We can find the value of... The, uh, p because it's e times p. So if e is 1, then we automatically know p is also going to be 7 over 2. Put it into here, and we have everything that we need. Okay, let's try one on your own. If you, if you want to give it a shot, pause the video. I'm going to start working it here. We need this to turn into a 1, so I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by 1 third. So this is 2 thirds now on the top. This is obviously 1, which is why we chose it. We get 1 third cosine of theta. So this form, now that we have it here, we know our eccentricity is that 1 third. The cosine tells us the directric is, is going to be about x. That negative sign tells us that we put a negative there. And then we need to find e times p, which is 2 thirds. So the top equals ep. So we know e. It's one-third times p. So just flip this fraction upside down, multiply it on both sides, and we're going to get p turns out to be 2. So we have our directrix, we have our eccentricity, we have everything we need. Okay, so now we're going to graph some of these. Now this is going to get strange too. This whole section is kind of strange. But first of all, what we want to do is we need to find our eccentricity and our value of p. So we're going to do the same game we did. We get it down here. So now you can see we know this is going to have a directrix that's an x, and it's going to be a positive. So we're going horizontally. This is the first thing we would note here. e is going to be the, it, that 1 that's in front of the cosine. It's not shown, but it's going to be a 1. So e is going to be 1. So ep is going to be 5 thirds. So if e is 1, p is just 5 thirds. So there's the value of our directrix. Okay, now we have everything we need, but what we're going to do next is we're actually going to graph this by picking, plotting some points to help us get the picture of this. Um, I'm sure someone more advanced could have done this just from using p, but since we're in polar form, it's going to be a little different. So we're going to take this equation. Remember, we're graphing in a polar system, so we have our numbers going in circles. Our angles are still the same. This is still 0. This is pi over 2. This is pi, and this is 3 pi over 2. 
but because our values of r, these are ex, uh, concentric circles going around and around. So I'm just putting in the different, we're going to take the key points for the, um, the axes, the key trig functions. We'll use these four points. If you put 0 and a cosine, you get 1. So tidy this down, you get 5 6. So you put pi over 2 in here. Well, cosine is, doesn't have a value at pi over 2, so this becomes 5 thirds. At pi, cosine is uh, negative 1. So that's going to create a 0 on the bottom and become undefined. And lastly, at 3 pi over 2, we put that in. Cosine is once again 0, so we get 5 thirds. Now, I was a little confused by this. Remember that we're in a polar form. So um, here at 0, we're going to be at 5 sixths. At pi over 2, we're going to be at 1.67. And at d, or uh, at 3 pi over 2, we're also at 1.67. Now, it isn't negative. I was confused by that, but I forgot. Because we're in polar, this entire circle all the way around the origin is 1.67. So it isn't negative. It's because we are in a polar system, okay, where those values of r are going to be positive. Okay, and there's our directrix over here, and there's our graph. So let's try it again here. We are going to take a look. First of all, we've got to get this in our form. Well, we need this to be 1. We've done this several times now. So I'm doing 1 half everywhere. Get it down to this. Now, e is 3 halves because it's sitting in front of the cosine. Because it's cosine, it's going to be about, the story's going to be about x. I've got a minus in front there. So uh, what do I have? Um, we need to find the value of p. So e p is going to be 4. We know e is 3 halves p equals 4. OK, so this is going to be 8 thirds. So we have our uh, directrix. We have e. We have everything we need. So let's plot some points in order to be able to create the graph. Again, remember, we're in polar. So sine of 0 is 1. Oh, sorry. Sine of 0 is 0. So this is how we get the 4. Uh, sine of pi over 2 is 1, which gets us this negative 8. And pi is going to be uh, sine of pi is 0, gets us 4. 3 pi over 2 goes in there, gets us negative 1. So I have to think about this one. At pi, yeah, here's what's happening. So this is polar. So at pi over 2, we're at negative 8. So normally 8 would be up here, but you can do negatives. It will take you just in the opposite direction. So at pi over 2, you'd think we'd be up here at 8, but because it's negative 8 at pi over 2, it basically turns into being down here at 3 pi over 2. So that's why we get this dot right here. All right, we connect our dots, and we've got it. Let me just check here. Hold on. I forgot to be mentioning this. The eccentricity here is greater than 1. So remember that table at the beginning. Go back and take a look at that. I don't have that memorized. But if you are greater than 1, you are making a hyperbola, which is what we've got here. We've got the beginnings of a bow tie. Okay. All right. Try a couple more of these. You're going to do one of them yourselves, hopefully. So we're going to graph an ellipse in polar form. So our first step is to make this a 1. So we do... Uh, one-fifth on the top and the bottom, and we get down to here. So eccentricity is then four-fifths. This is sine, so it's y. It's got a negative in front. Now we need the value of p, which is 10, or I'm sorry, 2 is going to equal four-fifths times p. Flip this over, we're going to get, I'm going to jump ahead, 10-fourths. They probably did the work right here. So you're going to get 10-fourths or 5 over 2. So that makes our directrix there, negative 5 over 2. Now, we have everything. Let's plot a few points here. So we're going to go, we could use the revised equation, the original equation, doesn't matter. Putting in 0, cosine's 1. This is going to get us 10. Pi over 2, cosine drops out. That's how we get the 2. At pi, cosine is uh, negative 1. So that's how we get the 10 ninths. And at 3 pi over 2, cosine is 0. That's how we get 2. Okay, so here we go. We've got all of our points, and we graph it. So at 0, we're at 10. At, at pi over 2, we're at 2. At, uh, at pi, we're at 1.1. Remember, that's a positive because we're in polar. And at 3 pi over 2, we're down to 2. And we've got our directrix on there. So our, our e was between, yeah, our e was 4 fifths again. And if you go back and look at that, that makes that an ellipse. And that's the picture that we got. 
Okay, let's try one more of these. If you want to pause it, I'd encourage you to do that. Try this on your own if you've come this far. But we're doing one-fourth on the top, one-fourth on the bottom. So r is going to be one-half, one minus one-fourth cosine of theta. Okay, so that makes e is going to be one-fourth. This is a cosine, so we've got x and a negative here. So negative, uh, we need the value of p. So one-half equals one-fourth times p. p equals, so we're going to flip that over, so p is going to be 2. Okay, so here we've got our eccentricity. That's supposed to be a 4, one-fourth. x is negative 2. Now let's graph some points here. 0 pi over 2, pi, and 3 pi over 2. All right, we put 0 in here. It's going to be 1. We're going to get 2 thirds. Put pi over 2 in here, it's going to be 0. We're going to get 2 over 4, which is 1 half. Put pi in here, we're going to get negative 1. So we're going to get 2 over 5. And lastly, 3 pi over 2. Cosine is drops out, so we're going to get 2 over 4 or 1 half. Okay, our eccentricity was between 0 and 1, so that's 1 fourth. Or ours is 1 fourth, so that means an ellipse again. And so if we graph this in polar terms, here's what we would have. I should have maybe not put that right where all my stuff is. But so here's my circle. And now again, this is polar. It's not Cartesian. So this is why at pi, we are at 2 fifths. So they've shown a Cartesian graph here, and that gave me some difficulty. But if you were graphing this polar, this is a cir circle. This would be a positive 2 fifths. So I don't know why they... They must have used some software that put it in Cartesian. But so we've been doing polar. That's why this is a positive here. That confused me for some time. Okay, um, I know that's pretty unusual, but hopefully that makes some sense.